Well, you catch in the tenor of my prayer some of my interest this morning. Uh, one of the things that I, I, I think um, I, I talked about with uh, some some folks from Otter Creek was uh, the experience of, uh, you know, when we did the thing right after I got started uh, coming over here, we did the thing with, with, uh, with Sharif Israel next door, and I got to meet Rabbi Saul. Most of you know Rabbi Saul, right? And, and my first time that I was there, uh, uh, Rabbi Phil Lieberman was also there. And uh, Rabbi Phil had been in our doctoral ministry program. And so I, I thought that was interesting because Rabbi Phil is a conservative Jew, which is very different from Orthodox. But Rabbi Phil is also really good friends with Rabbi Flip of Congregation Micah. And Congregation Micah is a Reformed church or synagogue, right? So you have Rabbi Saul, one side, Rabbi Flip, far side, right? And in, in, in terms of difference, you can't get further apart than how they view the world. Rabbi Flip came into our program because half of his synagogue is Protestant. All right? They are completely open to mixed marriages at Rabbi, or at Congregation Micah. They, they see everything from Scripture to the nature of God to Israel, to nearly, well, maybe not Israel, but nearly everything else. They see in almost opposite ends of the spectrum, right? Now, I say all of that because I've learned, I, I, I haven't learned it. I wish I could learn it. Um, not long after running into and meeting Rabbi Saul, I had a conversation with Rabbi Flip because he's now working on his project with this. And I told him that I'd met Rabbi Saul. And when I said, Saul, oh, he said, he said, my wife and I are best friends with he and his wife. His wife taught my children Hebrew. And I was stunned. First of all, why have somebody else's wife teach your kids Hebrew when you and your wife are both rabbis? <laughs> But that they would have that kind of close relationship to the point that in their family life, one is entrusted with the children of the other to teach them the sacred language of Hebrew. And yet they have such differences on so many other levels. And I want to learn from that. And I want you to know that when we come out at the end of any of these sessions, I don't need you to think like I think. I'm pretty certain God doesn't need you to think exactly like I think. So I don't mind when we reach those points where the, the, the triggers go off and you're going, no, not going there today. York just lost it on that one. Well, A, York may have just lost it on that one. Now, York wouldn't stand up here and say it if he thought that was true, right? But that has to do with what I'll talk about in a little while, which is the nature of truth. I'm a big fan of absolute truth. I just don't think any human being has captured it. What we all have are our small t understandings of that which move over the course of time and mine continues to move and so that's that's all part and parcel of trying to wrestle with the nature of scripture so i've spent a lot of time with this opening slide i want to remind you of two quick slides one again is this letter of inference and and just the struggle the struggle to rethink things and the struggle when we discover that something at the belief level may need to be reevaluated, you can't just start at the belief level to reevaluate something. You have to get much lower than that. And efforts to get much lower than that always are met with certain kinds of resistance because we've already, we've already gone too far. And we've already cut ourselves off from the bottom layer. And so trying to get to the bottom is always an interesting one. I talked a lot about brain function. Whoops, let me get back to that one. And, and I bring this up again just because, uh, again, I, this is what I have. When I get defensive, when something strikes me that I have struggles with, the first place I go is fight or flight, right? And then I have an emotional response. 
which is, I'm not going to listen to that guy anymore. And then, given enough time, I will get to a more reasoned response. And I may still disagree, but it's not as packed and it's not as fearful as it was to begin with. Now, I said some things last time. We talked about physical location quite a bit. We talked about some of these assumptions that we have. We talked about the regulative principle. Uh, I ended with this slide here. The, uh, the complication of certain kinds of constructs. The way in which in the 19th century, in an effort to, to support the Bible from what were believed to be strong attacks, particularly from rationalist uh, German scholarship, we came up with these words infallible and inerrant. And so I think all of those things uh, have, have issues. And then I, I spent the most time on that slide there. Uh, this way of viewing scripture, these varieties of ways of viewing scripture, some of which uh, came to us more by osmosis than by somebody saying this is what you should think about scripture. But there's a working out of that that I think has long-term implications for us. And then I spent just a little time on this slide, and, and this is really where I'd like to spend today. I'd like to talk about a more holistic view. Instead of seeing Scripture as God's rule book or God's manual and then deciding which rules count and which rules don't, uh, trying to figure out, have any of you ever watched the Jewel Miller film strips years ago, right? So you remember the covenants, right? The patriarchal covenant, the Mosaic covenant, and the, the Christian covenant. And which covenant counts? The Christian covenant counts. And when does the Christian covenant start? With the church. Starts with the church. Now, nobody said, therefore, since the covenant starts with the church, you don't have to read the rest of the Bible. But there was an implicit understanding there that says, where do we start paying attention really? In Acts. And so many of you, like me, lived through an era where there was not much preaching from the Gospels. It was almost entirely from Acts and the Epistles. And it was almost as though Jesus had to be rediscovered in the 70s and 80s. Because we had spent so little time with the Gospels. The Old Testament was, was really dicey material because we loved the stories that our children could hear and we could tell. Right? But, but we, we edited those stories most of the time, didn't we? If you do the Jonah story, you rarely, with second graders, when you're talking about the big fish and all those kinds of things, you rarely go to chapter 4 and talk about him sitting out there under the tree waiting for God to destroy Nineveh. Right? You don't, you don't go there with that story. Even though there's a sense in which that's the heart of the story. Because that's where the grace of God really is most manifest in the story. Um, you do the Abraham stories. You do Abraham and Isaac and all those kinds of things. But, but you don't spend a whole lot of time. This is an interesting thing only that I've thought about much, much later, right? You don't do much thinking about family systems when you tell the Abraham and Isaac sacrifice story, do you? You never ask the question, and how did that shape that kid's life from, from then on? Which is, of course, what we would do now. It's what we do now. So we edited those stories, but, but we would still use them. We would still use the Psalms and the Proverbs. One of my favorite people in the world is Terry Smith, and he will talk about the Psalms and the Proverbs being his mother and father in the faith. Right? Because of where he learns God and God's love for him. But in terms of, of what counts, the Old Testament doesn't count in that three covenant system. And that's what drew me initially to this vision. This is a vision that says, first of all, the story is written as an insight into who God is, more than it is written to be our instruction manual. It is a way of God's self-revelation being given to us. 
And when you start looking at it that way, I would argue that it does a whole lot of things for you in terms of some of the other conversations that we get stuck in, like which translations are valid and which ones aren't. When does inspiration take place? Was it only in the authorized version, the King James? Was it only in the Greek and the Hebrew? Was it only in the original manuscripts of the Greek and the Hebrew? You know, all of those kinds of conversations, as I pointed up earlier, they, they have struggles with them. Because we don't have any of the original manuscripts. And it's very clear that if, if the King James Bible is the only translation, then everybody else in the world has to get to English before you can even get to that. So there's just lots of things where we, we know that in our heart of hearts that doesn't make a lot of sense. So there's something else that's going on, and I, I want to argue it's this, and I, and I want to just talk through this a bit. You'll see that this time I put some scripture references up here. So let's just start, and, and you work with me as we work through the text here a bit. So we'll start with Genesis 1 and 2. The story of creation, which actually, when you read it carefully, is what? It's two stories of creation, right? There's the poetic version in chapter 1 that keeps having that recurring phrase. There was, is it morning and evening or evening and morning? It's evening and morning, right? There's evening and there's morning the first day, and the second day, and the third day. And of course, you only get to a solar system where you could have something like what we would call morning and evening on what day? Day four. And, and, and so the, the whole storytelling here is to emphasize what God is up to and, and the way in which he's going about kind of in this orderly but long-term fashion, whatever a day is, he's creating. And it's always good until he gets to day six. And when he gets to day six, everything breaks out, including at the end, let us make humans in our image. And he creates them male and female in his image. And he gives them instructions about multiplying and subduing the earth. And then he starts talking about what the plants are for. And it turns out in, in the first version, everyone on the planet is vegetarian. Including all the animals, right? In, in, in chapter 1. And, and of course, the story doesn't end until about the middle of verse 4 in chapter 2. And then we start a second story. And in the second story, before any of the plants are made and before any of the animals are made, God does what? God makes Adam. And everything else that, that is made is in service to Adam. So the plants are made, the trees are made, he's put in this garden. And once the plants and the trees are made, then all the other things are made. And he names them, he participates in the naming of them. And then God says, it's not, this is not good. Well, he's already said that, I guess, before he starts making all the animals. Because Adam has to name all the animals and none of them are, are, are worthwhile or enough. And so finally, Eve is made. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, Eureka. But, but I, I point out that in both of those stories, you have only the goodness of God creating only the best in creation, and humankind in both stories is the highlight of the, of the creation. In chapter 1, as the image of God bearers on the planet. In chapter 2, as the ones in deep conversation with God. As, as kind of joint creators almost in chapter 2. Not quite, but, but, but close. And then, of course, chapter 3 hits. And so you go from all of the goodness of creation and all the goodness of the garden into chapter 3. And chapter 3 then begins a string of stories that I would suggest goes through chapter 11 in which humans keep finding themselves in conversations as though God has left the building. So, I, you know, we could spend the, the rest of the morning just on the conversation that Eve ends up having with the serpent. Why we don't talk about talking snakes more, I don't know. Right? But you have a circumstance here with the talking snake. Do all the animals talk at this point too? 
what language do they speak? What language does God speak back and forth with them? Those conversations are assumed. They're never described. And the conversation has all kinds of pieces in it, from the way in which whatever Eve says to the snake about what God has said, either God said it to her, but it's not recorded, or she's remembering what Adam said, and either Adam didn't get it right, or she doesn't get it right when she remembers it, because it's not the same. But it creates this whole cycle then of doubt and fear and the, and the serpent convincing her that she is not enough unless she and in that in that shame of not being enough she eats and Adam is right there and he eats and and then begins some of my very favorite parts in all of Scripture and that's whenever God starts talking to people right because you have the absurdity the absolute absurdity of them hiding from each other and then trying to hide from God. And when you read the story, it seems like, you know, it's, it's like a parent playing hide and seek with their child, right? Where, where are you? What are you doing? Why are you doing that again? And of course, it leads to the, the curses. And I'll come back in a few weeks and spend a whole lot more time talking about the nature of that conversation. But it begins one of many, then, that are this ongoing story. Particularly in the next uh, several chapters, you have the exp expulsion from Eden. Uh, they have kids after they get out. They have the two boys. The two boys, for the first time, have some kind of internal drive to... It's almost like they need to objectify God as an object of worship. And so they make these sacrifices. We're not sure where those impulses come from, but they're there. One sacrifice is more acceptable than the other. The brother with the least acceptable sacrifice says, it's not my fault. It's got to be my brother's fault. You have a great conversation again where God steps in. He says, why, why are you so angry? You know, sin lies couching at the door. One of my favorite phrases in all of Scripture. You get to manage your anger here, Cain. And he doesn't. And you have the blood crying out and all those kinds of things. And it, his further expulsion. And, and then these kind of little snippet stories that happen where cities and culture and all that stuff seems to be born from the line of... Cain, including music, which I've never understood. And then the story deteriorates to the point where it's pure chaos again, and, and you know this part. God decides to start over, and there is one person who finds favor in his eyes, Noah. And so you get the whole flood narrative. And you bounce back and forth in the flood narrative. How many animals are going to go on this thing? In the end, it's two by two, but you have a, one reference in there about sevens, which is kind of weird. But the point of it is not so much the numbers as it is God's preservation of the species. God's preservation of humans. They barely get off the boat, and what happens next? It starts going bad again. Right? Pretty soon there's whatever uncovering his nakedness means. And the thing that follows that is the cursing. And then after that, it's kind of, you know, here it comes again until pretty soon you got all these people and they're trying to build a, a tower to God so they can, what? Be like, him. Be like God. And so you have all this stuff that happens at Babel, and everything breaks apart, and then lo and behold, way off down there in Ur of Chaldees, God finds this family, and he begins to pursue them. And you start getting the conversations with God and Abram. God, Abram, and Sarai, and then Abraham and Sarah. And those are, again, the interaction, what God reveals of God's self in those stories, 
is phenomenal when you just start reading and thinking about who is God. God calls this person just because he chooses to call him. You, you, you read a little bit later that he's off there in, in Ur of the Chaldees where everybody worships the moon god apparently and yet God calls him anyway. And for some strange reason, Abram starts following him. And this whole lineage then of hundreds of years of God creating a people for the sake of those people then being the revealing people of God to the rest of the world so that all of the world can be blessed. He's going to bless one so that he can become the father of many, right? But think about the conversations. And think about... On the one hand, the incredible faithfulness of Abram. I mean, he, he just takes off. Now, maybe he has nothing to lose. But every time he goofs up, what happens next? He gets richer. God sends him off, promises him a kid. He never gets, a, well, 25 years, he never gets a kid. So what's he try to do? He and Sarah hatch a plan. What are they going to do in the plan? We use a surrogate. Can't have kids? Have a surrogate. They have a surrogate. They have a kid. Wrong kid. God comes and says, well, it just doesn't come. God comes as three men, doesn't he? Shows up as three, and they have this conversation. And God, one, one, whoever is Lord in those three says, this time a year from now, you're going to have a son. Now, none of you are laughing. He thinks it's the funniest thing he's ever heard. He's, but he's, he's doubled over. Oh, that Ishmael might live in your sight. The wife in the tent next door, now 90 years old. He thinks it's funny. She thinks it's hilarious. Right? But my favorite part of that whole encounter is the three start to walk off and there is this internal conversation among God where God says, you know, I ought to tell, I ought to tell Abram what I'm about to do. Because he's got kin there. And he's an upright man. And, and I need to be transparent with him about that. It's a shocking story. Unless it's the story of God. Unless God is revealing his heart for the humanity that he's created. Unless God is trying to reveal the, the deep loving relationship he longs for with his creation and then they get into it and of course of, of course on the human side you get you get the barterer because what's Abraham want to do you know if you if you could find if you could find 50 He starts bartering with him. And you go through this whole progression. And God says, okay, yes, yes, yes. Well, doesn't God know? Sure he knows. But the point is the conversation. Now, I know I'm belaboring a point because I think it's a critical point. You can start following through. We can stop and, and spend all kinds of time with Moses again. Because the highlight of all of those conversations, in many ways for me, is not just getting Israel out of Egypt. It's God and Moses going back and forth with each other. At the burning bush, now that he's 80 years old and long past his, all of his messianic notions about himself, when God says, I want you to go back and lead my people, Moses says, no. Now you're talking, Larry, you're talking to a burning bush, right? And the bush is talking to you. And you know it's not a bush that's talking to you. You figured it out that this is, this is some really... Well, this is I am. But no, I'm not doing it. Really? 
Well, we take that seriously only till we ask ourselves about our own lives, right? And then it becomes the more possible to say, no, I'm not doing it. Or you, you start following through the story. There are those places, do you remember the part there in Exodus? Where, where they've been stuck because of the golden calf and all of that. And, and, and it's time to leave. And God says, Moses, get these people out of here. I'm not going with you. And Moses says, you can't do that. Think about your name. Think about what they'll say about you back in... Now, we, we can say all kinds of things about the, the humanity and, and the argument on the one hand, but on the other hand, what's the outcome? God says, okay. God changes his mind. And follows, or, or, or goes with them, and they proceed. Or, I, I actually wanted to look at this one. This is one of the real mysterious ones to me. This, was, this is in um, Exodus 24. Even when I was doing my yearly get through Exodus and then quit reading, I would, I would often not quite see this one. This is um, verse 8. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the seventy elders of Israel went up, verse 10, and saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like a pavement made of lapis lazuli, as bright blue as the sun. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. And then this line, they saw God and they ate and drank. Exodus 24, they saw God and they ate and drank. Now, I, I could just skip over from there to Passover or on to Eucharist or on to heavenly banquet. See, God's desire has always been what? <coughs> to eat and drink with his people. Now, what they saw of God, you know, Moses is going to want to see God a little bit later and he's not actually going to get to see much. You can go on through. Elijah's going to want to see God. He's not going to get to see much. So whatever this is, right? This moment in time, which by the way, the elders and everybody else, the, the, their short memories of that are going to be, be harmful to them. Uh, but, but I find all of those interesting. We, we could go all the way through these conversations because I would argue that, that all of the preparation of Israel and all of the, the pitfalls of Israel, whether it's in the life of the judges or it's in the life of the kings, the various things that happen along the way, the conversations that, are, that, that take place between God and the prophets, between the prophets and the people, all of those kinds of things are this ongoing conversation in which the human beings on their end of the conversation keep making the same repeatable mistake that was made by Eve and Adam in the garden, which is to just start thinking and acting as though they are like God. And the revealing in the story is, yes, God gets angry. Yes, yes, people die at times. But, but this is a parent trying to discipline his children, not because he's wanting to destroy them, but because of what? Because he's desperately in love with them. As we are our own children. And that ultimately leads him to become human. In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the Word. 
and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And we have seen His glory, glory of the only begotten Son of God. Words from the prologue, where in that gospel, in John's gospel, truth is not a concept, it's not a set of ideas, it's not a set of doctrines to be believed. Truth in the gospel of John is a person. I am the way, the truth. Or in chapter 4, the time has now come when people will no longer worship on this mountain or in Jerusalem. But they will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And, and translators have almost always done small s and small t. And we have turned that into right attitude and right doctrine. But in John's account, it seems much more likely that it's capital S capital T. The time has come when people will worship Father in Spirit and Truth. Father, Son, and Spirit will be worshipped. Because in coming to the planet, in becoming one with our humanity, in this story that's revealed of Jesus, where Jesus shows us the Father. Now we get the extent of the Father's love. I love when, you know, we sang that song last week, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he would give his only Son. What's the last line? For something, his treasure, right? But, but the point in this whole story is, it is, it is the self-revelation of God that's coming through here. I, I grouped Luke-Acts because I think Luke writes volume 2 to say, the church becomes the imitation of the Son. Volume 2 is the imitation of volume 1. The church is to be the same embodied presence on the planet. The whole point of Jesus' baptism has a lot to do, I think, with us imitating Jesus in our own baptisms. The words that God expresses over Jesus, they may not be audible, but I think they are supposed to be heard and known over our own baptisms. The coming of the Spirit in Jesus' baptism is, is to be imitated and received in our baptism. All of those things flow into each other. And the way in which the church then is not just the story that takes us through. Why does this? I know why it happens. Never mind. I get to practice anger management every time that thing come, uh, pops up. see it so I'll just go back and start over how's that the whole point in, in, in me spending all this time is to say when you begin to look at this way the epistles then are the beginning stories of people trying to figure this out in their culture and their time when you read through the Romans letter or the Galatians letter all of these are situations specific to the time and the people and the circumstances and there are ways of reading them then in, the, in those contexts that makes sense in those contexts. Consummation, the promise that whatever is happening now is not the end. You have these texts that say Jesus will, what, come again. And so we find ourselves living in the meantime, living in between. We find ourselves trying to figure out what it means to be the embodied Christ in our world in our time. For the sake of relationship, for the sake of being in relationship with God, not just when we die, but, but while we're alive, right? 
Because from Genesis 1 until now, we are on this planet to be the image of God to the rest of the planet. We, that's what we're here for. And as humans, we kept messing it up so much that God finally said, let me show you what that looks like. So reading the Gospels now becomes how important to us. If you want to know what God always intended for human beings on the planet, look at how he did it himself. If you want to know how, how God always intended for humans to treat other humans, look at how Jesus treated every other human being he encountered. This is not about rules that come out on the backside of that. It's about a way of being with the other in the world. Does that make sense? Scripture in this way opens up because now it doesn't matter whether, I, whether I'm looking in, in Exodus or Leviticus or Numbers or, or Micah or Job. Wherever I'm looking, the first lens is always on, on God. How is God being revealed here? Now that gets tricky at times because a book like Esther comes along and guess what? There is no mention of God in Esther. At least in the, the Hebrew Bible. In the Greek translations, somebody decided to add whole big sections in Esther so that God could be named. So if you haven't picked up a copy of the Bible that has the Apocrypha in it, you should sometime just to see the additions to Esther. But, but the point of, of spending all of this time today is to say, this, this is a way not of, of disclaiming the stories or disclaiming the history. It's a way of getting out of some of the boxes. I started off this whole thing by saying you have two different versions of creation in chapter 1 and 2. It's important to let them be two different versions. In the second version, humans get created first. In the first version, humans get created last. We're not talking about history here. We're not talking about how something really happened. We're talking about the one who made it happen. And the videotape of chapter 1 or chapter 2 doesn't exist. As though it would help, right? What we know even about videotapes is somebody sits off in a room somewhere and does what? interprets mm -hmm. and about what a fourth of the time we're pretty sure they got it wrong because we interpreted the tapes too at least I did right? this business of interpretation that's that's a human side of things that is a, a gifting of God it seems to me it is a part of what makes us human but those interpretations create grids and invariably as history now has shown over and over and over again invariably humans using the uh, capacities we have to interpret come up with different conclusions And from the beginning, right there with Adam and Eve, from the beginning, the question is, what do you do when you have two different interpretations? Well, the answer is, you rely on God. Yes. Does that mean you'll suddenly have now just one interpretation? No. It says we will trust that God is bigger than our human fallibilities in our differences. One of the biggest, in my mind, one of the biggest failures of Christianity in Western society, whether it's Europe or in America, and to some degree, whatever we have done to, to inflict this on others, is that we have managed difference of opinion so poorly. 
because difference of opinion only lasts about five minutes and then opinion becomes not just opinion but salvation doctrine. And I want to say no. No. God, God is the only one that gets to make that call. Now, you can find limits on all of our differences of opinion, I suppose. Right? But the, but the God who's revealed in the story, if you go back and you, re, you, you just read, yeah, you can read the stories where he's, he's done, but it, how long it takes him to be done is a lot longer than most of us. Most of us are done when the, when the disagreement lasts more than what? Five minutes? Two church services? Three months? Two years in a bad marriage? How long does it take God to get fed up? Well, we're still waiting for that answer, aren't we? Because God is still giving us breath every single day on this planet. And if it had been me, so a way of thinking about Scripture that doesn't take anything away from Scripture except some of the things that some of us have layered on Scripture. I think. Now that last qualifier, that was huge. Don't miss it. I think. Right? To begin to explore Scripture through this lens. To begin to look for what God is up to then and now. Among other things, this view of Scripture says the work of God doesn't end when Scripture is finished. This is just the lens for us being able to see what God is still doing in the world. This helps us delineate where God is at. So the more we know about Scripture, the more we know about the historical context in which Scripture is written, the more we know about the social circumstances of the people in their world and their time, the more we can both delineate the similarities and the differences between their world and their time and our own, the better off we're going to be in ferreting all of that out to get to God. So I raised the culture card last year, or last week, right? When, when did foot washing become a bad idea? Well, you could come at this one a couple of different ways, right? One, it's in the Gospels, so on the sheer force of covenant, starting in Acts 2, we could say, eh. But we always, we kept reading Jesus on marriage and divorce and remarriage. Foot washing became a bad idea with, what, the invention of socks, with shoes? <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been in a foot washing service or not, in some other group. It's one of the most powerful, humbling, spiritual things I've ever been in. But that was then, and this is now. You know, we, we, we too quickly jump to Greek one another with the holy kiss, whatever that means. And, and it's not so much that I'm, I'm interested in picking on one of those as it is I am interested in us figuring out how, how we live into how God is, how is God revealed in one of those? We, we believe God is revealed in, in death, burial, and resurrection of baptism, don't we? We believe very strongly in that. We believe God is revealed in bread and cup. So, you know, how, how, do we, how do we figure those out? How do we live with all of those different things? And how do we live then with the God who's revealed in the whole story? Not just certain parts that pertain to what you and I do when we come together on Sunday morning. Let's close with prayer. Father, forgive me this morning for the ways in which I have understated 
who you are, how you seek to be known and reveal yourself through your word, or for all that you long for me or anyone else to understand through your word. Help us, Father, daily to be hungering and thirsting for righteousness, for a better way of knowing who you are, so that we can better be the people you've called us to be. And Father, I ask that you would have I ask that you would have redemptive, loving presence in the midst of this body of believers here. That we might experience you as life and light and love in fresh and renewing ways. And that we might live into your promised and preferred future as your people. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.